So today I want to talk to you about the finite potential wealth problem from quantum mechanics. Now if you missed the previous lectures on the infinite potential well or the particle in the infinite square well, then I encourage you to go back and look at those before you view this video. Okay, so a finite potential well in one dimension is pictured here in this little cartoon. Basically, the energy is zero when the particle is inside the well. And that's region two here, okay, between, when x is between zero and l. But when x is less than zero or x is greater than l, there's a finite potential barrier, uh, some constant value, u, that um, exists, okay? Now, according to classical mechanics, the, uh, if the total energy of the system, E, is less than the um, depth of the well, U, then the particle would be permanently bound inside that well. And if the particle were outside of the well, then the kinetic energy would be negative if it only had an amount of energy E, right? And that would be impossible in classical mechanics. But according to quantum mechanics, there's a finite probability that exists that the particle can be found outside the well even if the energy of the particle is less than the energy of the potential barrier. And this is because the uncertainty principle allows the particle to be outside of the well as long as the apparent violation of conservation of energy doesn't exist for a really long time. Remember that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that delta E delta T has to be greater than or equal to H bar over two. So if the energy conservation violation isn't very much and it doesn't last for very long, right, limited by that h bar over 2 constant, then you're okay according to quantum mechanics. And this means that there'll be a finite probability that the particle is tunneling into that barrier on either side of the well as long as it doesn't do it very far. If it did it for a very long distance, then that would mean that it was inside that barrier for a long time, if you understand that, okay? Okay, so let's discuss the solution to the Schrodinger equation and how that goes for this finite square well potential and then figure out what the wave functions look like for this potential. Okay, now, u is equal to zero, right? So if the potential energy, when it's inside the well, which remember I called region two, um, region one was when x is less than zero and region three was when x was greater than l. So when it's inside the finite well where the potential energy is zero, then that is going to be the same solution to the Schrodinger equation as the particle in the infinite square well or a free particle. In other words, it's going to be sinusoidal functions, okay? So we already talked about this in previous lectures, the solution for the Schrodinger equation when u is equal to zero, but if you need a refresher, you can go back and look at those lectures. All right, now the boundary conditions, however, at the boundaries of the well, where x is equal to zero and x is equal to l, they no longer require that the wave function be zero there, okay? Because this is a finite potential and not an infinite one, all right? So the general solution inside the well is going to be a sum of sines and cosines. C sine kx plus d cosine kx. I chose to call my undetermined constants c and d here. And of course, k is the wave number, which would be two pi over lambda, where lambda is the de Broglie wavelength for the particle and is related to the momentum and hence the kinetic energy. All right, now let's look at regions one and three. If you look at the Schrodinger equation and rearrange things a little bit and solve for what's happening inside those regions, then you'll get the second order spatial derivative of the wave function is equal to 2m, where m is the mass of the particle, times u minus e, where u is that constant potential um, of the barrier height, e is the energy of the particle, and then divided by h bar squared times the wave function again. So basically what this means is that you're taking two derivatives of your wave function and you're getting back some positive constants times your wave function again. Now remember, differential equations 101, okay? <laughs> you look at a differential equation, you guess a solution, you plug that back in and see if it works. If it works, voila, you've solved the differential equation. So let's think up what uh, functions satisfy this criterion, that you take two derivatives of the function and you get the function back again times some positive constants. The only ones I can think of off the top of my head are exponentials, right? Where in the exponent, you have only real constants. So 
I'm going to write my general solution as a1 e to the alpha x plus a2 e to the minus alpha x, where alpha is going to be the square root of 2m times u minus e over h bar squared. Now, I'm going to ask you, the viewer, to plug that in and make sure when you take two derivatives that it satisfies that differential equation. But I promise you, it will. Okay? Now, your a's, a1 and a2, are your undetermined constants, and you'll figure out what those are when you solve your boundary conditions at x equal to 0 and x equal to L. All right? So, our wave function psi 1 for the region x less than 0, I'm initially going to just write that out as the solution that we guessed on the previous slide. But now let's think about some of the restrictions that we have on the wave functions for quantum mechanics. First of all, we say that the wave functions have to be finite everywhere because you can't have your probability of a particle's existence going to infinity. That doesn't make any sense. So what that means is that we have to plug in the infinity solutions into this wave function and make sure that they make sense, that the wave function doesn't blow up. So for x less than 0, then that would mean that x goes to minus infinity. Now that's okay for a1, right? Because then you have a1 times e to the minus infinity, which is basically 0. But for a2, you'd have e to the plus infinity if you plugged in x is equal to the minus infinity, right? So that means that for x less than 0, that constant a2 has to be 0 in order to avoid the wave function blowing up and going to infinity, right? Now, for x greater than L, for those conditions, when you take that out to the extreme values, x is going to go to infinity. If I plug in x going into infinity, then I can see that my a1 e to the alpha x would go to infinity, okay, as x goes to infinity. So that means that for x greater than L, a1 has to be 0, all right, to avoid those infinite values and infinite probabilities of existence for your particle, which don't make any sense, all right. In fact, since you've got a potential that has a constant value on either side, you know that your wave function is going to have to go to 0 as your particles move off towards infinity, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. Because by the uncertainty principle, you can't have your particle traveling too far into that well, or it's going to be in there for too long a time, and that doesn't make any sense by the uncertainty principle. All right, so we know that a1 is equal to 0 as x goes to infinity, and a2 is equal to 0 as x goes to minus infinity. So we have our solutions to our wave functions for regions 1 and 3, just looking at the solutions to the wave function for region 1. Nice. Now, by symmetry, there's no reason that the wave function on the left, where x less than 0, shouldn't mirror what's happening for x greater than L. There's no reason it shouldn't mirror and be symmetric. In other words, if I fold it in half, the solution should lie on top of one another. So what that means is that my a1 and my a2 constants should really be the same value, right? They should be the same. There's no reason that the amplitude of that wave function should be different on the left and the right-hand side of the well. So I'm going to say that a1 and a2 have the same value there, and I'll just call them both a. Okay, so here's what I know. I know that I'm going to have an exponentially decaying function once I reach and exceed the boundaries of my uh, barrier, and I know I'm going to have a sinusoidal function inside the well. So what would that look like? Well, it would look like this. Okay, so here's the cartoon. I've got a sinusoidally varying function for my different energy levels inside the well. It reaches the barrier. The wave function has some finite value when it reaches the barrier, and then from that value, it decays exponentially to zero after it hits the well wall. Okay? Now, this is very different from what the classical solution would be. Classically, if the particle has an energy less than the potential value, right, then it's not going to be able to exist in that region. However, quantum mechanics says, sure, it can do that as long as it doesn't do it for very long, okay? And so that's a really huge difference here between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. Now, this is my wave function, but my probability density is going to be proportional to the absolute value of my wave function squared, and so this is what the probability densities look like for um, the first three energy levels of my finite potential well. And you can see that that means that there's a non-zero probability that the particle is tunneling into the wall of that potential barrier. All right. Now, how would you determine those undetermined constants, A, C, and D? 
Well, you would solve your boundary conditions, right? So you solve your boundary conditions at x equal to 0 and x equal to L. The restrictions that we have on our wave functions are that they be continuous and smooth and their derivatives be continuous and smooth at all places. Okay, so those give you your boundary conditions. At x equals to 0, it would say that psi 1 is equal to psi 2, and the derivative of psi 1 is equal to the derivative of psi 2. And it would be the same kind of idea at x equals to L. Psi 2 would have to be equal to psi 3, and the derivatives of psi 2 and psi 3 would have to be equal to one another. Remember, I called my wave function for x less than 0 psi 1, I called my wave function for x between 0 and L psi 2, and I called my wave function for x greater than L psi 3. All right? So the wave function and the derivatives have to be continuous everywhere, and that's what these boundary conditions are telling us. Now, if I apply those boundary conditions, first of all, let's solve them for um, x equal to 0, right? So remember, here's what my wave function looks like. Psi 1 is a e to the alpha x. Psi 3 is a e to the minus alpha x. Alpha is that square root of 2m u minus e over h bar squared. And psi 2 is c sine kx plus d cosine kx. Now solving them for x equal to 0, I'll do explicitly in class. I don't want to go through that in this little online video. But if I do that, then I find that a and d are actually equal to one another, and that c is proportional to a. c is equal to a times the square root of u minus e over e. Okay? So, um, make sure if you're following along this video and you're not in my class that you can do that algebra and solve for that. All right, now, for x equal to L, solving the boundary conditions would give this value. So here's how you would set this up. Um, I'm not going to do this here yet again. But doing this would give you the quantization conditions for your wave number and hence your energy level values. Now, part of the reason is but I'm not going to do this here. The full solution is a little involved for modern physics one anyway. It's really something that you should do in your advanced, more advanced quantum mechanics course. So I'm going to let your quantum mechanics professor deal with that. Okay? The solution for the energy level values has to be done numerically or graphically for one thing. And it's really tough to do analytically. All right? So I'm going to let that rest for now. And uh, as long as you have sort of a qualitative understanding that the energy levels would be quantized and that the s solutions would look similar to the infinite potential well solutions, but with just an exponential decay once it reaches the barriers, I think we're good to go for modern physics one. All right, so yet again, here's what the energy level solutions and the wave function solutions look like um, for that particle. Here's the finite potential well on the left, and here's the particle in the rigid infinite potential well box on the right, okay? So you can see, it's kind of leaking out there at the edges, all right, for the finite potential well. But remember, it has to go to zero for the infinite potential well, all right? Now, although an exponential decay doesn't have a sharp ending point, you can use the parameter that I'll call eta to measure about how far the wave function extends past that classical turning point where the barrier of the well is um, before the probability has decreased to almost zero. And this is often called the penetration distance, all right? So here, eta is equal to 1 over alpha, which is equal to h bar over the square root of 2m times u minus e. All right, so that's about how far it is. So you can see here in this little cartoon that it's basically decaying to about 0.37 times the value of the wave function at the edge. And that's what eta measures. Okay, I'm going to leave it for there. Um, we'll do this clicker question in class. And I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, as always, let me know.